Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 334. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today, we got Kevin Rakestraw. Hey, Kevin. Hey, how's it going? Good. Got you over the phones today. Yeah. Uh huh. Here's a little uh, thing that we do. So, when we record the show, we actually do the last part first, we do the new releases first. So, you'll notice the quality of Kevin's audio changes drastically during that segment it's because his internet was not cooperating never does and so we had to switch to the phones never does anyway this week on the show we'll be reviewing Britt Poulton and Dan Madison Savage's Them That Follow we'll also be talking about someone watching on the watch list and going over this week's new releases in theaters VOD and Blu-ray thank you so much for joining us today remember to please consider reviewing us on iTunes if you get a chance that would be amazing couple housekeeping things uh new ryan watches a movie will be dropping on thursday and there is a new saved by the 90s out if you haven't listened to that uh it's on a separate feed just search for saved by the 90s you'll find it we talk about spoof movies we review four spoof movies that came out in july so we talk about Hot Shots, we talk about Robin Hood Men in Tights, we talk about Jane Austen's Mafia, and we talk about Basketball. Fun episode, however, we didn't have a lot to talk about. What? They're spoofs. Yeah, but spoofs. like audibly describing a spoof movie is actually harder than you might think, because it's a spoof movie, so there's like, you know... 37,000 jokes in there and a lot of them are visual gags and it's just I don't know it was it was hard to talk about so mainly we talked a lot about the sort of downfall of the spoof movie and why, why we don't really see spoof movies so much anymore yeah bummer all right with that I think we can dive into our review we're talking about them that follow I have a synopsis here. Set deep in the wilds of Appalachia, where believers handle death-dealing snakes to prove themselves before God, then the follow tells the story of a pastor's daughter who holds a secret that threatens to tear her community apart. Goodness. Got some notable people in this. Caitlin Dever, Walton Goggins, both of them were in Justified together. Jim Gaffigan's in there, and um, Oscar winner Olivia Coleman's in there. The Jim Gaffigan casting is one that was a surprise. It works, though. It works perfectly. Yeah, yeah, it I just, works. I, I believed it wholesale, right off I the did. bat. I, 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 like, I, I did, I did, too. I could see Jim Gaffigan handling snakes. <laughs> uh, Kevin, what did you think of them to follow? It's, it's, it's uh, decent enough. It's, uh, I don't really, for me, it wasn't really remarkable in any way whatsoever. And it was also kind of interesting in the sense that y- you feel the length. It's, it's an hour and a half long. I'm not saying that it's like, it feels like way too long or anything, but you know, it feels like a substantial movie, hour and a half. But then when you sit and think about it afterwards and think about, you know, what actually happened in said movie, I don't know how it was an hour and a half long. Yeah. Cause like nothing happened. Like, it's a very, very basic story, and I just don't, I don't know how they did it. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely on the same page with you here. I thought it was fine. There isn't a lot of substance. I don't feel like they dive too deeply into the whole Pentecostal snake handling thing. They don't, they don't really dive into, the, like, the, the actual practice itself too much. They more so look at the, the people who subscribe to this practice and uh a lot of it feels very surface level to me although Mm -hmm. i do find the subject matter to be fascinating so in that i thought it was it was entertaining i thought the performances were solid across the board Mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like one of these movies that I saw this uh, almost a week ago at this point, and it's already fading. It's already fading from my memory. Yeah. I mean, it pretty much, it faded like a couple of hours after watching it in the sense that there's, like I said, there's not, 
there's nothing really remarkable about it. There's nothing memorable about it outside of, you know, snakes. But, and I, I would say that that's the, the one thing that I did um, for the most part appreciate with this movie is they don't, they don't make these people like absolute caricatures of, you know, Pentecostal snake handlers. You know, they're just, mm -hmm. they're just presented as people that just right. happen to deal with serpents. They say take up serpents. You can take up any serpent. Like it doesn't say, it doesn't specify rattlesnakes. Like they could just be garden snakes. Just fondle some garden snakes and just move on with your life and stop killing yourself. You know? Yeah. Why is it going to well, be rattlers? Uh, I don't I think that there's the, I think there's probably a reason behind that. Like the element of danger or something. Like if, if you're worthy, then yeah. it won't bite you. And if it, and if it does bite you and you survive, then that, that is representative of like overcoming, yeah. you know, whatever. It's the, it's the strength of your faith. Yeah. But it's just a rattler. Rattler does not It's just like, put me down. Why are you touching me? Yeah, there were some good snake scenes in this. I think they were all real. Like, I don't recall seeing any like CG being used. No, and it, I, I do got to say that it feels like they failed on that level, though. Because even with the, this, the small number of snake scenes, right, that are present in this movie, I never was really like, I never had this like tension like, oh, Jesus, all these snakes. It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, snake. And you know the, that obviously the setup of this, someone's going to get bit by a snake. You know that that's mm -hmm. going to be the point in the movie. And yeah. you know exactly when it's going to happen. Like as soon mm -hmm. as it's kind of like set up, you're like, well, you know who's getting bitten by the snake. Yeah. So there was never really, it never really seemed like they capitalized on that. As they, you know, draw out tension with the whole snake handling thing. It just kind of felt predetermined. Yeah. There were like really two, two moments, two snake handling moments that uh, I think that were intended to be very tension filled. And during one of them, you know, right off the bat <laughs> that this person is going to get bit. Like it, it's, it's just <laughs> pretty, it's pretty, gone. pretty much <laughs> telegraphed. Yeah. <laughs> like this person, this person's done. Which is, there's a little bit of that too throughout the movie that I thought kind of undercut everything. Cause there's a scene um, or a sequence not too long after that, where said person is laying in bed and the shot beforehand is an ax. And then the immediate next shot is him laying in bed with the arm. And you're just like, well, I know what they're doing now. You know, and then, you know they, happen. Yeah. And they kind of draw that out and it's like, we are, you already told us like, there's no need for this. Like, did you really have to show the ax? Getting back to the performances again, I thought everybody did a really good, great job. Walton Goggins plays the, the, the father of the, the main character. And, uh, he, he's like the pastor of this, of this, uh, church. He's great. I, I think that was a, this, perfect yeah. casting yeah. choice pretty much yeah i don't think you can i don't think you can get anyone better for that and olivia coleman plays uh just one of the church members but she also owns like a gas station and uh she she's really great in it too i mean obviously i, I would always prefer her to be in a comedic role but she has proven time and again that she can handle a anything any yeah. role that's given to her and so she's yeah she's pretty great in it uh caitlin D uh deaver is she she doesn't have much to do in this no uh she, she's, she's not the main, yeah she's not the main character the main character is it uh angler and there's this sort of love story thing that's happening in it too that feels uh, even though it's central to the plot, it feels somewhat half baked to me. Like I never even got, like, I wasn't even sure what the status of Mara and Augie's relationship was uh, played by Thomas Mann. Yeah, it was, it, it's a bit odd at first. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. You know, it just seems like they kind of, they've known each other for a long time. They're kind of sweet on each other. And then it's just like not a thing anymore. And then it's a very serious thing. And then, you know, to add the whole Garrett angle in there, you know, to make this a triangle. Yeah. 
it just feels wholly undeveloped. But it's like the, the unfortunate thing is, it's like the main crux of the like it's the entire movie, really. Right. Exactly. And, and this is something that they don't. I I feel like they don't really explore this too deeply either. You mentioned the Garrett character. Uh, he's played by Lewis Pullman, and like they was this like an arranged marriage or like like what was what's happening here with this where they announced that these two are getting married but it's like does she does she like him was this something yeah, she, that the father like yeah i get that sense but it's like why is this happening was it an arranged marriage did did did, uh, did walton goggins no i think it was just up? i mean i think it's mostly just to, to cover up the, the situation that she's in, you know what I mean? In terms of she discovers something. Yeah. Which, so, but yeah, I mean, I don't, but I, I don't think she discovers that until after they get engaged though. Yeah. Maybe but it's, but. It's, it's very bizarre. Yeah. And, and, uh, Augie is not in the church. He he's, left the church. He's one person. Of the entirety of that mountain is not in the church. And just, there's some developments just felt out of place to me. Like the, Mara's character felt a bit off considering that, you know, she was raised in this church. Her father is the pastor. And for the majority of the time, she seems to be fully engaged with it. And, you know, the whole faith angle, everything. And then out of nowhere, she just becomes this very defiant person and then Garrett's character just he seems kind of nebbish and then all of a sudden he's like this yeah they uh so abuser it's just like what yeah so that that was an interesting turn so like what what they do there is there's like one scene where Walton Goggins is like you know you you need to you need to be the man or whatever and I guess he's like he takes that as, oh, I should be like awful. I should be an <laughs> awful human being to my fiance. Yeah. This is and he just takes, he's, his character just takes a complete 180. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he becomes this like monster. And you're just like, like oh, wash okay. my feet. <laughs> wash yeah. my feet. It's like, what? Had a long day. Wash my feet. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's, it's kind of bizarre some of the choices the more yeah. we the more we deconstruct this movie the the less i feel about it well and also even when you said in the synopsis that you know it would like tear this community apart i never got the sense that like her and augie's relationship would somehow tear this community apart no i mean it seemed because you got to remember like like you said everybody in this little town is part of this church so you got a lot of people and this seems like it's a very centralized, like focused conflict that's occurring between a few people. It yeah. doesn't seem like it would necessarily tear the community apart, especially when at the beginning of the movie. And then like, if you think that the bite is going to have something to do with it, I don't think so because at the beginning they mention uh, like a boy who gets bit or something and they're just like, oh, it happens, you know? <laughs> and I think, I think if I remember correctly, they said that the boy was dying, like he died or was about to die. Yeah, they, they usually do. Yeah, because they, they don't, it's, yeah, it's they try, they try to treat it with the power of prayer, which uh, Rattlesnake Venom does not give a shit about prayer or faith. No. It just courses, just courses through <laughs> just your body. Pump. Just it pump. just ravages your insides. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, fairly, fairly disappointing. This one. Yeah. Unfortunately. A little bit let down. There's, there's some strong elements to it. I mean, it looked, it looked pretty good. Uh, nothing, nothing amazing, but no. there's some decent cinematography in there. Any final thoughts? Them that follow? Uh, no. Ask me, and you know, at the end of the year, if I remember this movie, and I have a feeling that I won't. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, what are you gonna give it out of ten? Mm, 
I think of it like a four and a half, five. Yeah, I'm sitting at around a, a four on this one. I'm tempted to give it a bump just for the performances. So may, maybe I would give it a four and a half. That's then the follow that is playing in select cities right now. Let's move on and talk about some of what we've been watching. You're going to be surprised to hear this, Kevin, but the Fantasia Festival has concluded. No, it hasn't. It's, it I is. Just, a, no. I just read that they extended it three months. It is a, they've, oh my God, I don't even know what I'd do. <laughs> I'd just pass out. There's a couple other ones that I can mention that I saw at the festival that have since screened. One is called Tone Deaf. This is directed by Richard Bates Jr. He's the guy who did Excision and Suburban Gothic. Okay. Two movies that I that, that I thought were okay, but flawed. Excision being the stronger of the two. But I thought that they were both pretty pretty solid. He's He's an interesting director. He has some really interesting ideas that he brings to the screen. He does a lot of like kind of like fantasy, like nightmare scenes that are always really, really well shot and, and kind of visually trippy. And he does that with this movie too. So tone deaf stars, Amanda crew and Robert Patrick and uh, Amanda crew plays this uh, like millennial who she gets, uh, she ends her relationship with her boyfriend and then she also gets fired from her job and she is just stressed out with life and her friends are like, you need to just get away, get out of the city for the weekend or whatever. So she rents this Airbnb and it's like this giant house. It's huge. And I don't know why she decides to rent this enormous house just for herself but at at any rate she does and it's owned by robert patrick now robert patrick is this uh i would say he'd be like a maga hat kind of guy okay and he just lost his wife his wife committed suicide and he rents he rents the house and he's he's getting older and it's it's unclear because he says it in the movie, but it's it's unclear if he's like just lying. But he says he has dementia and he his his life is coming to an end and he's done everything. He's seen everything, but one thing he hasn't done is killed another human being. So he wants to kill somebody and he decides he's gonna kill Amanda Crew. And uh it's it's really this sort of really overt allegory for the the growing cultural divide in our country where you have Amanda Cruz this sort of super liberal very PC person and then you have Robert Patrick who's this like older boomer who thinks that the the younger generation is destroying our country and blah 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 and gotcha. it, it it doesn't really work in this scenario it it seems like there's not a lot that richard bates has to say other than just like hey you know like the 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 conflicts that we're having as a society like let's let's just put that on the screen it's 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 not doesn't really propose a solution or anything like that and it i would say that the the robert patrick character is obviously the villain of the story, but he kind of pokes fun at, at the millennial generation as well. It's all right. I'd say it's going to be on VOD very soon. I think it's fine for like a VOD rental or maybe wait till Netflix or shutter gets it. Yeah. The, like the, the kind of trippy uh, hallucinations come from Robert Patrick in this one. And he, when he has these like delusions, he's like always in this white, completely white room and he's dressed in a red suit and all the objects and people in the room are completely blue. Uh, yeah. Get it? Uh, so it's like a whole red versus I blue think, thing. I think, I think I'm piecing it together. Yeah. 
like a like a like a political thing. Maybe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. It looked cool, but it was uh, a bit, bit on the nose. Yeah, yeah. I got to see uh, Julia Hart's Fast Color from earlier this year. So this is uh, kind of in the news recently because apparently it just got picked up. Amazon is going to be, I guess, turning this into like a series produced by Viola Davis. So kind of worked out timing-wise. Get to see, all right, see this movie. If I like it, check out the series maybe. This I actually did enjoy. Uh, this It felt kind of similar, somewhat in the same vein of Midnight Special, where it's this not really a superhero movie, but yet people have, you know, some abilities and it's just, you know, it's all kind of uh, just rooted in, in realism, but just with, you know, little bits of their, their superhuman abilities that they have. And here this is a, a family that it's kind of passed down uh, on the, on the female side throughout the family. And they kind of keep track of everything in this big, this big tome, you know, everything that they can do abilities wise. And of course, some government people are trying to look them, look for them, track them down, do test on them. But it also takes place in this. I can't remember exactly like how long they haven't had water, but they're very, very low on water. Like it hasn't rained for like years like water costs an exorbitant amount of money. And so there's that element to it as well. But the thing that got me with this is the writing. Like it's not necessarily an origin story, but it kind of is just a little bit because you have three generations uh, of people with these superhuman abilities, which what they can do is like essentially take things apart, which is just like any object kind of break it down into particles and then, put it back together with their mind. So you have the three generation thing. So you kind of have this origin story, but you also have the main character of Ruth, which is played by Gugu Mabatha Raw. Uh, like she's the lead and she's kind of like on the run because she was at one point picked up and they were running tests on her, but you don't really see any of that. You're kind of introduced to her as her breaking out and returning to her family. So you kind of have that as an avenue to explore, you have the way that it ends up ending, which is a perfect drop-off point because you can go in numerous different avenues with that. So it really makes a lot of sense that they're going to develop this into a series because it feels like there's a ton of things that they can do with it, like a lot of history there with this this whole storyline. So I'll be interested to see how this series plays out. Cool. I'm going to have to give this a look. Uh, last week when you said it, we we talked about this, I think it was last week, and I, I said that I heard bad things about it. The, I got this mixed up with another movie that has, I can't find the movie, but it has a similar looking poster. Hmm. It was a movie that came out earlier this year, and it was like a, I think it was like a love story. And I, it was in theaters for just a very short amount of time. And I can't remember the name of it, but at any rate, yeah, I, I, think got, I, know I got it could... mixed up. I feel like there was a movie that came out at the same time as Fast Color that I used to get it confused with. Yeah, I can't remember I can't, what it is. Uh, I saw one called Home Wrecker. Uh, this is uh, directed by Zach Gain, and it this is kind of uh, I don't know how to describe this movie. It's not great. Well, uh-huh. I'll, I'll start it with that, and it's basically about this uh, young woman who. It meets this uh, older woman in her yoga class and she kind of atta- the, the older woman sort of attaches herself to the younger woman and, and it like shows uh, a very strange interest to her. And uh, she ends up going over to this woman's house and the woman turns out to be sort of crazy and keep like locks her up and it ki- sort of kidnaps her. And I guess she's planning on killing her. Although I'm not sure she like thought that far ahead. It stars Alex Esso, who uh, was in starry eyes. And, yeah. uh, the, the, the older woman named Linda is played by precious Chong. 
uh, she's very bad in this. And like it, the, she does a good job of acting like a crazy person, but at the same time, her acting is not very, very good. Uh, there's these, these fight scenes that occur between the two of them where they're like kind of fighting and wrestling and the, the fight scenes are so bad. It's baffling how they looked at this and were like, yeah, this works because it's just, uh, it's frustrating the fights and I, I don't know. It, uh, it just didn't, there were some good ideas at play. There was some fun twists, but yeah, it just didn't, it just didn't really work. Uh, again, that's called home wrecker. I do not have a review for this up. This is the only, there's only two Fantasia movies that I didn't review that I saw out of like 20. And this was one of them. Yeah. It makes sense because it seems like you're, you're frustrated to the point of being speechless. Yeah. I, I, I just don't have a lot to say about it. It's, it was just not very, it was just not very good. Yeah. Those are fun to write about always great when you have the opportunity to just be like you know what not gonna write about because i wrote yeah. 25 other ones yeah i mean with this one it was like i didn't i didn't like hate it i didn't hate it so it wasn't like i wanted to write a review that just ripped it apart or anything um because like i said there were some good ideas in it but it was just like i i didn't want to have to after i was done with it i just wanted to be like okay i've seen it i'm done with it i'm putting it away well, the only other thing I saw, which uh, I think came out earlier this year, or maybe it came out last year. I can't remember. The Hit You Give. Is that a last year movie or this year? Yeah, it was last year. Last year. All right. Getting caught up over here. So this is uh, directed by George Tillman Jr. Uh, overall, this is it's pretty good. It feels extremely polished in the sense that you can tell that this was made for what I would call quote unquote general audiences, you know, to try and appeal to everyone to, you know, to try and bring in as big as audience as possible. So with that in mind, it feels a little bit neutered in its, you know, in its pointedness we're dealing with race relations and everything. And it just, it feels like there could have been a little bit more to it. <clears throat> I mean, there's still a great deal in there, but again, it just, it feels like, a, you know, a studio version of something that could be far more radical. But I think overall, for the most part, it works. Uh, it, you know, accomplishes what it sets out to do and it has a great performance. You know, this movie is completely anchored by Amanda uh, Stenberg, who plays Star, the, you know, the main character. And I think she really makes it work her performance really makes it work. And, you know, it's, it is what it is. I, it, it, I was kind of surprised that it was as good as it was. Cause I had a feeling, you know, that this could have really went, uh, it really could have went south. Mm -hmm. It just kind of been, you know, a bit ridiculous, but overall, gotta say it was pretty good. That's the hate you give thug. This. And that's a weird thing that they kind of like. And now, granted, I haven't read the book that this is based on, but <clears throat> the the one character that ends up getting shot by the police, he, he talks about thug life, you know, Tupac's whole philosophy. And they kind of like bring it up numerous times throughout the movie. And it always just feels kind of weird, like really inorganic, the way in which they bring it up. So it kind of has that like after school special feel like they're kind of like shoehorning things in, mm -hmm. which kind of takes away from it. That's what I, you know, it kind of has that feel to it. Like they're trying just a bit too hard. Right. Uh, the final one that I'll mention is called the divine fury. This was added as like a secret screening at, at Fantasia. It was the, the final movie that they screened. It's directed by uh, Kim Ju Hwan. This is a South Korean action horror movie, which involves a an MMA fighter who teams up with a priest in oh, order yeah. to uh, carry out a series of exorcisms. It turns out that the city is being plagued with these 
possessions. Like all of a sudden, just everybody's getting possessed. Yeah. And this this uh, MMA fighter, it turns out that he he like develops stigmata in his hand, mm. and it turns out that he can exercise demons out of people very easily with his crazy stigmata hand. Oh and so the setup for this sounds awesome, right? Like action horror yeah. movie, MMA fighter, priest taking down demons. It sounds incredible. In in practice, however, uh it's it's not. It's mm. it's actually very subdued. It's very slow. Uh, it's it's a, it takes a really long time to get moving, uh, and th- this is over two hours long. It's like two hours and nine minutes long. So the setup is way way too too slow. And while there are some fun and exciting moments, overall it uh, just it doesn't really have any kind of it doesn't really pack a punch, so to speak. It. it the end is kind of cool. Like he ends up, he essentially powers up his hand and the, the fist, his hand goes from just having stigmata to like lighting on fire. And it's like this like white flame that yeah. he can make come out of his hand. And that's awesome. Especially when he's like punching people with it. And the, the effects work is actually really solid in this. It looks, it looks quite good. But at the end of the day, there's just not enough. There's not enough no. action. There's not. You, you go into a movie like this for some crazy, fun action, and there's yeah, hardly it, any in there. It sounds ridiculous. Like it sounds like you know, you have stigmata hand, which he uses to beat people senseless. Like the power of Christ compels you. It levels that hand up to the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So you, it, it sounds like this would be incredible. Yeah, he doesn't level it up to the very end for the like the final boss fight. Yes, and I mean, I, I feel like a movie like this has potential. Like if they if they made a sequel where it's just the two of them going around, yeah, you know, rapid fire exercising demons all over the place, like that that would be more fun. But as it is, like he's he's reluctant to to help, and he's he's sort of a tortured person uh, in and of himself. Like he sort of lost his faith after his father died. It turns out that, well, uh, it might be a spoiler. It happens near the beginning, but I won't divulge how he dies. But anyway, his da- his dad's a, a cop and dies on the job, and. He so like a lot of the movie is about him sort of reestablishing his faith and it doesn't really maybe maybe my expectations were were off and and mm. that's why I didn't come out of this like really loving it but uh there's some really creepy kind of the creature effects done so like it turns out that he's being haunted by demons and there's like one scene where you see all the demons that are haunting him. And there's like two dozen of them that just surround him all the time. And it's, oh, wow. it's uh, that's, it's a really crazy looking scene. And um, there's also this one sort of demon that has like human, like tons of human arms growing out of it. And that's a, a really creepy looking demon. And other than that, you know, it's just, it's okay, but it just wasn't what I expected, and uh, yeah. it left me feeling a little disappointed. It sounds like it has the potential to be special. Like what I'm hearing sounds special. Yeah, unfortunately, there's just there's not a lot of action at all. You know, it's hmm. it's set up to be like this really fun action horror movie, but there's very few action scenes, and he doesn't really punch people with his stigmata hand, he just kind of like places his palm on their forehead and it's just their, their heads light on fire. Oh, and he calls it a day. <laughs> it's an easy job though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good, uh, that's good work. If you can get it. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's it. That's all I have. All right, let's take a look at what we have in theaters this week. Got a couple notable ones. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is the, the big one for me, at least. I'm pretty excited oh, for yeah. this. There you go. Do you have any interest in this? I do. Nice. Maybe we can get you out to the theater this weekend. Oh, boy. Oh, goodness. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we also have The Kitchen coming out. The, the Kitchen, huh? Yeah, yeah. This is the one with uh, Melissa McCarthy and Tiffany Haddish and Elizabeth Moss where they play like mob wives who their husbands end up in prison and they take over the the business. Okay. Uh, It takes place in the 70s in Hell's Kitchen. Gotcha. I'm into it. It's based on a comic book series, a Vertigo series. Interesting. Which I haven't read, but... Usually Vertigo stuff is pretty pretty solid. There you go. Yep. We also have Dora and the Lost City of Gold. This is the live action Dora the Explorer movie. Of course. Naturally. Uh, every, every time I see this, <clears throat> it, it stars, it, it features um, Eugenio Derbez. And I can only see him as the, in that one that one movie he's in where he's like, how to be a Latin lover. That's that's all I can see him in. And then to see him in a kid's movie feels weird to me. <laughs> uh, I don't love know. It. Uh, love I, it. Either way, this is certainly not a movie for me. No. Uh, another movie that's not necessarily for me is The Art of Racing in the Rain. This is another one of these dog movies. Ooh. They've just been churning out these. Re- just come out with a good dog movie, people. I mean, I'd say John Wick 3 is the best dog movie of the year. <laughs> uh. See it and you'll agree with me. We also have the Peanut Butter Falcon. This is the one with Shia LaBeouf, who he's like a a drifter or something and he befriends this guy with down syndrome and they go on some kind of adventure or they go to like uh, find like a a wrestling school i was really hoping that you would say he befriends a falcon no the name comes from his the guy's wrestling name like that's what he wants his wrestling name to be or something like that okay interesting yeah, I don't know. This this one doesn't really appeal to me. Let's see. We also have Dying to Survive. This is in limited release. Brian Banks. I, I keep getting emails about this. This movie does not appeal to me at all, but it's like a sports movie. All-American high school football star committed to USC who finds his life upended when he's wrongfully convicted of a crime he didn't commit. Uh, after the wedding... We got One Child Nation. We got Necrotronic. And that looks like it's it for theaters. VOD Mm -hmm. this week. We got, on the 6th, we got two hours, which is like two colon hours. Okay. Teenage slacker Tim Edge gets more than he bargained for when he convinces his two best friends to skip skip a school trip oh man tim discovers he only has two hours to live so it's like he tries to do a bucket list and uh, it's just uh, it's exhausting for me to just even describe this movie any further (laughs) not having no moving on consequences 17 year old andre is admitted to a correctional facility where he met, meets Zelchko, who begins to exploit him in return for keeping his sexuality a secret. Oh, okay. Mm. There you go. Uh, the Night Sitter. This is a horror movie from the creator of Final Destination. Hey. Don't read this bedtime story aloud. Oh, no. Don't do it. 
And then on the ninth, we have Corporate Animals. This is with um, Demi Moore and Ed Helms. Wow. That's a throwback. <laughs> we have Necrotronic. And that looks like that's about it. If you're wondering, Necrotronic looks... You got to see that poster. Holy cow. Oh, it looks cool. very rough. How do we spell Nick? And there we go. Oh, it was the K. Yeah. I was wondering. I was wondering if they're going the K route. They did go the K route with it. Down on his luck, sewage worker Howard North discovers he is part of a secret sect of magical demon hunters. Oh, oh boy. Watch out now. Yeah, he just gets dragged into the global conflict between the necromancers and uh and Finnegan. <laughs> demon, evil demon named Finnegan. Yep. Yep. That's it. Which apparently is played by Monica Bellucci, which that would not have been my guess. No. Well, not that is this movie is full of surprises. Yeah, you gotta wonder if she's doing somebody a favor with this one. Wow. Very strange. Incredible. Blu-ray this week. We got Alice, Sweet Alice from 1976 coming out on Arrow. Hopefully, oh, yeah. hopefully we'll have a review for this one up by the time this drops. I'm gonna try to squeeze it in after we uh, record. Pokemon Detective Pikachu. Surprised with that one. That was a surprisingly fun, decently made video game movie. One of the very, very few in existence. Wow. Yeah. It's a good time. Batman Hush. This is an animated DC movie now. Usually these are pretty solid. I, I checked out the trailer for this one. Looks pretty good. Uh, the, the Hush storyline in Batman is very, very good. One of the most famous ones. So I think I'll probably be giving this a look. The Curse of La Lorna. Uh, hmm. I did not hear good things about that. No. Gods and Monsters from 1998 getting a Blu-ray release. Tolkien from earlier this year. This is the biopic about J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm-hmm. The Reflecting Skin from 1990. Never okay. heard of that movie. Me either. Yeah, the Reflecting Skin. Um, Charlie Says, that's the uh, Mary Heron one that was not very good. Came out earlier this year. Tiger Milk from 2017. The Souvenir. And Donnie Brook, How Long Will I Love You? Plus one from earlier this year. That one I would recommend giving a look. I would, I would say it's a, definitely worth the VOD rental on that one. It's surprisingly very funny. Yeah. Changeland, a movie called Do Something Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Just do something. God. Who would you? Fucking Jake. And it looks like that's about... Oh, can't forget. Palms also coming out. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it looks like that's about it. What about Criterions? Uh, we have just the one, which is just a, a like a Blu-ray reissue. And that's uh, Angel at My Table from 1990 from uh, Jane Campion. This is uh, like an autobiography of uh, Janet Frame. Famous New Zealand author. It's, it's, uh, it's a good movie. Uh, it's got audio commentary 2005 from Camping. The the woman that plays Janet Frame, Carrie Fox, and the the uh, cinematographer, Stuart Driver. Short doc making of deleted scenes. And then an audio interview with Janet Frame herself. Cool. And that's it. That's all, that's all for Criterions. Cool. All right. Yeah. I think that's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulse.net and at filmpulsekevin. And if you have a minute, 
take a look at uh, the reviews section on your podcast platform of choice. We would always appreciate reviews. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name's Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week. To our land on God's blessed shore.